in the Yoga Sutras, there is a, a statement. Shraddha, Virya, Smriti, Samadhi, Prajna, Puravaka, Itaresham. Um, this translates to higher Samadhi or a higher state of oneness and clarity, realization of God and Spirit, is preceded by faith, energy, memories of previous spiritual experiences, cognitive absorption, the ability to focus, keep your attention where you want it to be, and the revelation of inner knowledge. And the very first word in this higher samadhi is preceded by, remember, in this process, it's the first word in the list of things that are the most important. Well, in this statement, in order to experience higher samadhi, the very first quality is faith, shraddha. And that's the sticking point, isn't it? <clears throat> Because in order to have faith, you either got to have a few things going on. Uh, you have to have experienced someone in your life that you love, that you trust, that you see who is successful, and you are safe around them, and you want to be like them, and you're willing to follow their example. Not many of us have that experience. Right, because of people who were raised by, you know, our, our priests, our ministers, they do things that are questionable. And so we want to have faith, but we see things that make us think, wow, I mean, how, how can we do this? Uh, one of my friends, he's a Methodist minister, he, he would always say, uh, the, the quickest way to lose your religion is to become friends with your priest. <laughs> it's sometimes true. It's true on one level because. Um, if the person you're learning from is just a human being, which we all are, then you'll start to see, oh, they've got some stuff that they're working through. And rather than just recognize that they're actually working through it, they become disillusioned and say, well, they're not perfect, so therefore it must not work. And so they lose their religion. Um, or it might be um, that the person actually is a very good example for you, but you don't have the capacity to appreciate it and you don't want to grow into what they're encouraging you to grow in. You know, many people say they want to have a, a teacher like Sri Yukteswar. How many of you have read Autobiography of a Yogi? Okay. How many of you wish you had a teacher like Sri Yukteswar? Okay. Okay. Uh, let me, let me change that. How many of you actually do wish you had a teacher like Sri Yukteswar, but you can't quite see yourself enduring his discipline? Anyone? Yeah. So that, that, that is an example of, that's one way that you can lose your religion too, by becoming too close to your, your, your spiritual preceptor. You know, for me and Mr. Davis, um, for the first 10 years, I mimicked him. I would do whatever he wanted. When he said, do this, I did that. When he was talking about something, I didn't question. I just listened. And, um, and I'm kind of still to the to this day that way. But I realized over time that I, I couldn't imitate him. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't dress like him. I couldn't behave like him in the sense of imitating his mannerisms and so on. But because I was young and I thought that's what you were supposed to do, that's exactly what I did. And as time went on, I realized I had to express my own understanding of this. And so I do, but what I learned from him and his example is still the exact guiding light that I use. I didn't study with him and decide to alter what he said, right? I didn't make it fit my own agenda. And the reason that's the case is because, you know, I met him when I was 20. What did I know when I was 20? I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew what was important. And so I studied with him. And I kept practicing, I kept doing what he said. And he would give me advice on certain things. And almost all the time I would take it. But there were maybe two or three things that I thought, well, he's just out of touch. You know, he was quite a bit older than me, came from a different generation. Well, he just doesn't, he's just out of touch. And so I wouldn't listen. And a few years would go by and I would see, oh, he was actually right. And then another thing would come up and say, well, he just doesn't understand my personal situation. 
right? And I'd make excuses and I'd do it my own way. And sure enough, a few years later, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's, he was right. And that happened enough that now, whenever I think about how to teach, what to do, I think about Mr. Davis. And if he wouldn't do it, if he wouldn't recommend it, I won't either. You know, there's only so many people, um, there's only so many people that he spoke about as far as um, useful sources of information when it comes to the spiritual path. And um, I only read those things and I don't recommend anyone else, right? Um, which maybe that's a little limiting, but the reason that's the case is because I know how accurate that information is. And when, they're, when, I, when I learn about other teachers and so on, and I listen to what they say and they're not in alignment with that, I don't feel that that's accurate. And so I won't recommend it. And that can seem a little fanatical, but we have to remember, going back to this idea of devotion and your relationships, when you're in a good relationship with someone and there's something you don't get along, like you, you, don't, you don't feel the same way or you don't, you don't believe in, do you decide to be unfaithful then because you don't think the same way or, or you don't believe the same thing? No, you understand that in a relationship, you're not always going to think and believe the same thing, but you're still working towards a common goal. And so you stay true in that regard. Um, Mr. Davis, when, when he first started studying with Yogananda, Yogananda told him, he said, for the first year, read only my books and read only the books of the masters, the teachers within the, within the lineage. And Mr. Davis was a, vor a voracious reader. He loved reading about philosophy and other, uh, other saints and sages and so on. And he found a book, I don't remember who it was, um, but he found a book and started reading it secretly. And um, he, was, he was walking by and Yogananda was there and Yogananda said, Roy, Roy is, is a spiritual adulterer, right? <laughs> He didn't mean adulterer in the sense that we think of it, but you know, English was Yogananda's first language. And he, he'd found out that Roy was reading another book. And, and he, said, he said, I told you to read only my books so that you would understand where I am coming from. And once you understand where I am coming from, then you can read anything you want and you'll have the discernment to know whether it's true or whether it's not true. You, you understand? And so, um, Devotion in this regard also brings up the sense of truth because when you are devoted to a path, to a teaching, to a teacher, and again, you know that that person is actually representing what you're trying to learn um, and you trust them, that truth will grow in you and then you will begin to know from the inside what reality is like they knew what reality is. So this is where the idea of truth and devotion comes in, uh, in this regard too. And again, it just boils down to, um, being a good person, uh, in all of your activities, being as truthful and as loving as you can be to the best of your ability, remembering that you have, you have, most of us have a storehouse of karmas, which will sometimes make us behave inappropriately. But if you maintain your awareness and you see it when it's happening, the next time you can try a little harder not to engage in it. And eventually you, you stop. Okay? So sometimes you go through experiences where you, where you might have, you might not be behaving appropriately, but if you can have the light of sattva there and you can see how destructive that is, not only to yourself, but to other people, to other family members and so on, how hurtful that is. And if you're practicing ahimsa, the next time you know, I am not doing that. And what happens is that is what burns your karma. It's the realization of the truth of the matter. Okay. The reason I tell you that story, not necessarily to get you into my business and you know all my nitty gritty stuff, but a lot of people, when they're on this path, they think they have to be perfect from the very beginning, right? And it's not that you have to be perfect from the very beginning, just like you're not perfect in relationships from the very beginning. You just have to be devoted to the, to the process of becoming a more perfect person in that experience, right? Not type A weird perfect, I mean sincere and being able to feel the truth of things. So anyway, um, going back to this sutra on faith, I was fortunate in that with Mr. Davis, 
I was able to be with someone who is rock solid. There was never a situation other than my own stupidity when he failed me in that or misled me in that. Uh, even when I talked about yesterday, the idea of uh, a teacher not knowing everything and still, and that is a way of expressing truthfulness. It wasn't often, but there were occasionally situations where I'd bring it up to Roy and say, I don't know. And he didn't make any big grand gestures about it. He said, I don't know. You know, that's not my area of expertise. And that in itself was so reassuring because he was being honest, because he was being truthful. And I've been fortunate in the friends that I've had and relationships that I've had um, where I could have faith in people. And I feel that one of the reasons that I was able to have that faith is because I did my best to be dependable, to be as solid as possible, to be as consistent as possible. Because you are going to attract whatever is within you. And that is why when you begin to practice truthfulness and you're not good at it yet, you, yes, might attract a teacher or two, which is not quite up on the, not quite on the up and up, but that's okay. They're resonating at your current state. But if you keep practicing truthfulness, eventually you will be led to uh, sources of guidance, which manifest that more readily. You know, after Mr. Davis died, um, there was a deep sense of mm, something happened after he died that I began to understand things in a very different way. And I can't describe it, but when I read his books or when I would read The Holy Science, it was like there was a, an inner knowing uh, of higher principles and higher realities. And my meditation began to change which wasn't happening when he was alive. And I realized in that experience that because we had a relationship, because he knew who I was and I knew who he was, that means that I was within his consciousness and he was within my consciousness. So when his body dropped and his consciousness went into something else, probably lighter, brighter, greater, more radiant, a part of me went into that. Kind of follow what I'm getting at here? It's, it's hard to describe. And, and so in that way, it was beneficial. And of course, life happens. People die, people pass on. But the people that you know, when they move on or transcend and they become part of lightness, that also means a part of you becomes that. And that's why I don't grieve Roy's loss. I miss him. I miss hanging out with him. I miss his body. You know, I miss being able to just be in his presence and so on physically. But there's no sense of loss because he's there, right? He had that relationship with Paramahansa Yogananda. And since Yogananda was a part of his consciousness and I was a part of Roy's consciousness, well, that field, I am a part of Yogananda's consciousness. And so on, back to Sri Yukteswar and Lahiri Mahasai and Mahavatar Babaji, which means anyone that you know who knew Roy, you are also a part of that consciousness. You are also more a part of that light. And by living in accord with the yamas and niyamas, by practicing as faithfully as possible, and by being honest with yourself and, and maintaining a sense of awareness as best you can, you are better able to access that field right? You're better able to access. And so when you go through an initiation or you say you are part of the lineage, don't think of it like you're joining a weird cult. I mean, you kind of are, but, but realize that what's happening is you are just simply becoming part of that, that field of awareness, that field of consciousness, and that stream, that stream of, of, uh, that stream that flows into the ocean of spirit, right? And then that is what that is that is what you give your devotion to because the more you put your attention on that, the more that light flows through your own consciousness, the more Thomas falls away, the more Rajas falls away, and the more you're able to abide in the states that um, the yogis describe. And once you have that faith, well, then what comes? Then you the word that's described here um, is virya, which means vigor, and that, that virya is enthusiasm, 
right? Many of us don't make progress on our path because we don't have enthusiasm or we're depressed. And depression and the heaviness and the doubt, here's the thing, that's just Thomas. Remember that energy that we talked about? That's just Thomas. It means that where you are right now, there's just an abundance of Thomas. And so you're more likely to become doubtful or depressed. And how do you fix it? You do whatever it takes to cultivate this sense of faith. You, can, you might have to play mind games with yourself. You might have to come to groups like this often because in groups like this, that energy of truth and whatnot is a little more palpable, a little more, you're more sensitive to it. For me, as I mentioned, I don't particularly like big groups. So what I would do is I would just go visit Roy. I just wanted to be in his presence. I would sit with him. And since he was so established in that, that, that state, anytime I would be around him, that would shake off some of my Thomas, some of my Rajas. And I was less likely to want to do things which promoted uh, anxiety or anger or aggression or, or things of this nature. And I had to keep going back and I had to keep experiencing it. But we have to remember that we don't want to become dependent on groups. We don't want to become dependent on a person. We want to use that experience as like a launching pad like training wheels, right? We want to, so we can eventually ride ourselves without the training wheels. So we go, we experience it. We have a few weeks of more sattva, we lose a little bit. So we go again, we experience it, and eventually it gets stronger and stronger. But eventually what you learn to do is you simply learn to remember what I said, which is, remember, I was a part of Roy's consciousness, he was a part of my consciousness, to Yogananda, to Sri Rikishwar, and so on. I know you, you know Ishidas, um, you know Swami Nirvanananda, you may know other people that knew Roy, you may know other people that might have known Yogananda. Anytime you remember that you are part of that consciousness and you can meditate upon it and allow it to be real for you, you will rise out of the Rajas and the Tamas. And you have to do it enough until you're strong enough that you can just stay up there. And that's what all of these saints and these sages did. This is the purpose of all of the, um, all of their devotion was to have such sattva that there is no going back to darkness. There is no going back to the heaviness, the inertia, the rajas, the change and the transformation. And that is why you are here. That is a very real and valid experience. You're still you know, might have a fender bender every now and then, you still might get athlete's foot, you know, your, 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 your roof might still leak from time to time, but that's just what's going on in your physical realm of your body, right? That's just what's happening. But, but as you become more clear and developed inside, you know what you truly are. And you know that all those things are gonna pass and change and you'll get the right ointment and the roofer will come, you know, and the car will get fixed and so on. Um, so that is what we're doing. And then when you, this is, this is the, the culmination of the whole thing. And then when that becomes stable for you, when it comes time to leave this world, when your karmas are exhausted and you're done, you don't have any need for a body anymore. You don't have any need for the relationships that you have. You will be so established in that, that when it comes time to drop the body, the body just falls away and you remain in that state of lightness. And if there's another realm, higher realm for you to experience, you know, astral causal or so on, you'll just flow into it. And the issue is you will remain as aware there as you are here right now. Because what most people do is they just go through their life doing their stupid shit all the time and they die. And they're like, oh, what's this? A dream. Okay, now I'm back in a body again. You know, it's like there's, there's a brief flash. There's a brief flash of, oh, I, I see. And you know, that's when, when people go through near-death experiences, even if they're not profoundly spiritual. They see the light, they feel the love, they feel the awareness, but because their consciousness hasn't burned away all the, th all the original sins that draw them back to this world, they have to come back to a body until all those things are gone. Whereas if you get an individual who's practiced their Kriya Pranayama, done their Jodi Mudra, knows how to flow through the tunnel of light, knows how to stay present in the astral and the causal realms and deep sleep, then when the body drops away, they are as here, or they are as there as they are here. And that's it. And then if they need more spiritual practice in a, in a subtler realm, they just continue it there. They don't have to come back with the athlete's feet and the leaking roofs, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Then they've got to deal with other things. <laughs> better things. Um, so the whole purpose, your life, this is the purpose of your life. That's what it boils down to. And when you bring more devotion and love into your life, it makes it 
much easier for you to stay in that state, to persist, to, to flow into a state of clarity, a state of pure awareness, and stay there no matter what happens. And if you can do it while you're asleep, if you can do it while you're stuck in sleep paralysis, if you can do it while you're sick, then when the body falls away, you can, you can do it then too, and you're free. <laughs>